Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to Data Bank's Career and Investment Summit for the first one for 2022. Uh, we're very happy to welcome you, and I am delighted about the program lineup that we have today. So before we get started, I am just going to ask our head of sales, Emma Somia Kwao, to say the opening prayer. Then I'll come back and tell you all the things that we will be doing today, and then we will get going. So Emma, if you are there, please unmute yourself and pray. Thank you. All right. All right, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for making this day possible for us. We are most grateful for the life we have, and we are most grateful for bringing us together to learn and to educate ourselves. We pray for this program. At the end of the day, may we have something that will really equip us for the future and make us successful in all our endeavors. This we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, all right, so let's get started. Let me tell you what is coming up today. Um, we actually have two presentations today, one from our guest of honor, Rami Beatty. I don't know whether any of you have heard him speak before, but if not, you will be in for a real treat. Um, he will be talking on keys to career success. We will have um, a Q&A session after he's finished. We'll give away some prizes after that. Then we will have an investment presentation by Data Bank's CEO, Kojo Adai Mensa. Then we'll take more questions, do more giveaways, and then we are done. So that's, that's the order of the program for today. For now though, before I introduce Rami, let me just greet those who I see. At least I see your face. So Norte, I see you. Um, welcome. Good, so now people are turning on their videos. Awesome, okay. Richard, I see your fan. I don't see your face, but I see your ceiling fan. Jeremiah, Emmanuel, Majestic Chica, driving in his car. <laughs> Daniel, um, I see you, Maxwell, another Daniel, Mary, let me see, James, Katie, Theophilus, Clara, um, Junior, Awusu Agbe, Pius, I see you, Francis, hey, I'm seeing a lot of people, I can't mention everybody's name, but oh my goodness, Elizabeth, I see you, Senyo, Eddie, Nathaniel, Philip, Welcome, Isaac. Welcome so much. Um, Clara, I think I called your name already. I don't remember. Augustine, Agnes, Mary. Everybody, thank you for taking time out of your schedules. I'll greet the rest of you later as we go, but thanks for turning on your cameras. I appreciate it. Thank you for um, taking time out of your busy schedules. So let me get started. Um, by introducing Rami, our first speaker. And please, I mean, these, these points that he will share are really, really important. He's been doing um, what he does for a long time. I will read his profile, but take your time, take notes, um, because we may even give out some prizes based on what he says. So take some notes and then we'll get started. So let me tell you a bit about Rami Beatty. So Rami is the Director of Corporate Affairs and Institutional Management at GIMPA. And um, from 2016 until now, he has also been running his own training consultancy called Athena Social Consult, where he specializes in soft skills and social talks. He is a proud alumnus of Achimota School. He got his first degree at uh, University of Ghana in 1987. I wonder how many of us on this call were where we were in 1987. Were we even alive? 
Um, and then he got a second degree in um, his MBA in marketing in 1993. So he's been around for a long time. He has worked in the automobile industry, mainly in charge of corporate affairs at Metropolitan Insurance. So he did that for a while, then worked at Ecobank and then worked at UT Group as head of group head of corporate affairs and marketing. He is married with three children, an avid reader, a movie buff, and Rami, you will have to tell us your favorite movie before you start talking. A sports fan, you will also have to tell us your favorite sports team, and then a music lover. And he used to have a program on the radio. I'm not sure if he still does, but he loves music. And he also has a blog called Rami Talks. So Rami, it is a pleasure to have you. I see you, let me spotlight you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Jillian. Nice to see you. Nice if to see on you. Screen. If on <laughs> yes. the screen. You're looking different. Am I? I've taken off my glasses. Ah, okay. Uh, the hair looks different too. What's left of it, yes. <laughs> Gra grass, grass doesn't grow on a busy road, you know. <laughs> so welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So I will turn it over to you to talk, and then um, I will prompt you um, when it's time to wrap up, if okay. you have not yet done so. All right. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Jillian, thank you very much indeed. It's always a pleasure to take part in any event with Data Bank. I must admit, I almost feel like a family member and uh, I'm, you are. I'm, claiming, I'm claiming that for myself, whether you like me or not. And uh, you Welcome. asked me to mention my team. I'm an Arsenal fan, which means I understand the meaning of pain and suffering. <laughs> and I'm also a big fan of Accra Hearts of Oak, phobia, okay. phobia. And of course, after, especially after last night, Ghana forever, right? We are the mm. World Cup now. <laughs> well and you also asked me to mention my favorite movie. It's, it's, yes. it's a small movie called Water. And it's set in a fictitious uh, country in the Caribbean. You may never have heard of it, Jillian, but uh, it's called Cascada or something. But it's a wonderful comedy called Water. You should look for it. Okay. Michael King. Okay. One of my favorite all-time movies. Anyway, cool. and that has definitely Thank helped you. me in my success being um, a movie buff. So a good morning to all of you. I'm hoping that everybody on this call is as young as I've been asked, I've been told. And uh, I'm glad I can get to you while you're still young to find out and learn about things which I wish I had known myself before I started out on the path on which I am now. But um, what we are gonna speak about today, basically, are little things. The very little things which um, people don't take seriously. And unfortunately in Ghana, this is a major, major problem for us. It's most unfortunate. Little things are often viewed as being insignificant, which is, I guess, why we call them little things. But in reality, the little things are the spice of life. Imagine you are cooking, and I don't know how to cook, by the way. Very good at eating, but terrible at cooking. And you have to put, you taste your food and it's tasteless and it's bland. A bit of salt maybe, and you think, what else can I add? That little pinch of something that you take, that spice, that little pinch, that little thing is what might make your career for you. The main cause is your career. It might be bland, it might be tasteless, it might be unsatisfying without spices. But when you take the little things and add them, suddenly it's a meal. It's no longer just a dish. So simply put, you enhance your chances of a successful career by taking care of the little things, which when ignored, when ignored, and distract you from your focus and especially in getting onto a career path. So basically I'm here to share what I think are 10 keys for career success. You may ask that if they are little things, then how can they be key? Well, let me expand. So in no particular order, here are 10 keys that I would ask you to pay attention to at some point before you start out on your career and keep them with you throughout your life. The first one, time management. Time management. I don't know when God created Ghanaians, it's as if he threw away the clock and he said, well, you'll be there. I mean, you know, take your time, do what you want when you want. Not something we take seriously in this country, unfortunately. And therefore, when you meet people who are conscious about time, it's such a wonderful surprise. It shouldn't be. And my advice to you is take this point in particular. Like I said, I'm not putting these keys in any order, but time management. Timekeeping is an attitude. 
Okay, it is an attitude that you must develop in your life. Social life, corporate life, everywhere, you need to develop it. Excuses are simply not acceptable. Anybody can give a, um, an excuse. We all know how to say, oh, traffic, oh, um, my Uber didn't come on time, something, whatever. Excuses are unacceptable. It's as simple as that, okay? Prioritize in your life what needs to be um, achieved and think on your feet. If your Uber is late, what is plan B? If you're heading somewhere and there is traffic, what is plan B? And now we have mobile phones, so please don't forget that. So live your corporate life, live your life now according to deadlines. It may sound harsh, but no, you must live your life according to deadlines. Start and end meetings and events on time. Manage the time consciously. Look at things like your commute time. How did you get to where you are today? Did you get there by uh, your own car, taxi, trotro, share ride? Look at your commute time. How can you use that time? Can you read? Can you study? What about time spent on social media? I mean, that's a big one now. Social media, I'm doing it myself. I'm spending way too much time. And this year, one of my uh, thoughts was to cut back. And I have so far. Look, when you start your job and before you start your job, ask yourself, what is the average time I use for completing a report, for writing an email, for writing a brief? How can I make it shorter? How can I fit it within the bounds of my corporate and social deadlines during the day, every day? Okay, so please note, time management is not about clock watching. It's about making the most of the time that we have. And don't forget, time is finite. It's not infinite. We all have a limited time on, on Earth. So please note, time management is not about clock watching, in spite of everything that I've just said. It's about making the most of the time that we have. And making the most, you must qualify that. In your job, in your family life, in your social life, making the most of the time we have. If you go out to hang out with friends and you have work the following morning, you have to be there to start work by eight and you stay out till 11, 12 on a weekday, have you managed your time? wisely. So you can start from now. I'm going to end this section on time management with a quotation and ask you to think about it yourself. It's humorous, but a meeting without food should be an email. Discuss. You're not going to discuss it with me. We don't have enough time for that. But think about it for yourself. A meeting without food should be an email. So that's the first key. The second one, manners and courtesy. Yes, you heard me right. Manners and courtesy. Now, you young people get a bad rap concerning manners and courtesy, basically saying that you don't have manners and courtesy. I'd like to think that's not true, but I'd also like to believe that truly you are not conscious of how much manners and courtesy mean. Now, some people will tell you that the only difference between human beings and animals is manners and courtesy. After all, what can a dog do except scratch itself and wag its tail? Let me assure you that manners make up the man and the woman. They mean something. Let me give you a, a quote. Being considerate of others will take you further in life than any college or professional degree. Let me read that to you again. I have it here in front of me on my screen. Being considerate of others will take you further in life than any college or professional degree. Basic courtesies like, hello, please, thank you, sorry, should become second nature to me. I was fortunate. My mother was a solid fancy woman and she hammered these things into my head nonstop. Hello, please, thank you, and sorry. Manners and courtesy boils down to basic things like knowing how to take a hint. When somebody drops a hint about, please go away, should you go? Probably. And you see, things like knowing how to take a hint will help you in salary negotiations. We are sitting before an, an HR person who says to you, so how much salary are you expecting? Know when to speak, know when to be silent, know when to take a hint. As you go about your daily life, knowing that yawning, stretching and cracking your knuckles like this in public are not good ideas will help you look better than most. So if you're sitting down with somebody in preparedness for an interview and the person stretches uh, and somebody sees that person, already they've committed the first faux pas, stretching and yawning in public, okay? How you do things like handle negative comments, how you handle taboo topics. For example, let's say now it might be a bit difficult to indulge in a conversation about homosexuality. Or for example, you are at a place where they are discussing religion in Ghana and there are people taking sides, charismatic versus orthodox. Your good manners should, should shine through here. How do you take a, um, a person's um, opinion? Staring at people, something so basic 
Ghanaians love to stay, but it's rude. You can't just stay at a person like that. Accepting gifts graciously or not. How do you say no to a gift? Some of you are going to end up in banks, insurance firms, and you will find that there are rules about accepting gifts there. So now you are a young man in a bank branch and you are enjoying the job, which is nice. And then one day at the end of the year, a, a high net worth um, client comes to you and says, uh, oh, this gift is for you. How do you say no to that person and not offend them? Especially if the person starts saying something like, hey, do you know that uh, your MD is a good friend of mine? Then what do you do? Suddenly you are hot. You have to think about it. It's all part of good manners, believe me. It is all part of good manners, how to accept a gift graciously or not. You are creating an impression, offering a seat to a lady, holding a door open for somebody, helping someone to carry their bags because they are holding so many, all make you look good. Let me ask you something without you um, answering me now. Do you know when to hug and kiss in public? Do you know when to hug and kiss in a corporate environment? And when you do kiss, how many kisses? I'm referring to kisses on the cheek, oh, by the way, not on um, lips. In the COVID time, we're not doing any of this, but now COVID is hopefully fading away. How many times do you kiss? Your eating habits are prime. Whether you're having breakfast with somebody in the canteen in the morning at your desk, you don't blow on your food, for example. You don't slurp when you are drinking. Serving size, if you're eating by yourself, fine. If you're eating in public with members from your office or guests, do you pile your plate high? The use of cutlery, when you go out with friends, when you go out on an office lunch and you see the amount of cutlery around your plates, do you know who trying to use for what? Manners and courtesy, little things, but you are creating an impression. Okay, and this is so important, whether you're going to the movies, whether you're going to church on a Sunday, on a pew, sitting with somebody, how do you behave? In the office, most of all. And one of the most important, which doesn't have any formalness, mobile phone etiquette. Mobile phone etiquette, manners and courtesy. When you sit down for an interview, where is your phone? Is it on display? And why is it on display? Is the sound up? As I'm sitting here speaking to you online, there's nobody here with me. Fine, but my phones are on silent. Mobile phone etiquette. So that's the second one, manners and courtesy. The third one, grooming. Grooming. Now, grooming is basically projecting a personal brand and image, and eventually your organization's brand as well. When you get up in the morning, what is your aim? Are you going out to look for a job? Do you belong to a company already? If it's a Sunday, are you going out to evangelize, for example? Little things in your grooming count. For example, your underwear. Gentlemen, you may think this is too personal, but it's important. Gentlemen, do you wear briefs? Or do you wear boxes? Do you like to feel free? Or do you like something that packs you a bit more comfortable? Your zips, as you're leaving the house, do you check your zip, your trouser zip, for example? Is it up? Is it closed? Before you go and stand in front of a lady who is looking down at your zip and smiling, and you're wondering why. Is it because she likes you? No, it's because your zip is open. Buttons, gentlemen, for example, when you wear, well, this is also ladies as well. When you wear a shirt, just an, an ordinary shirt, do you close this button? It can make you look tidy. It can make you look untidy. Okay, cuff buttons, cufflinks maybe if you if you prefer that. Buttons, little things. Okay, handkerchiefs. Okay, you're sitting in front of somebody. You want to cough. You want to sneeze. Do you have a hanky to pull out? In front of boys, and I'm sure there are some on this call. In front of boys, use two handkerchiefs. Good on them. I'm an Achimutan. I use only one, and one works for me. If somebody says the bones in your shed are bent. Do you know what a bone is? A bone is that firm thing that sits in your shirt collar. Okay, and it can bend if it's plastic. It can actually break. Do you know how to change it? If you wear a jacket and there's a space for a lapel pin, do you use it? Do you put a pin on that jacket? What pin is appropriate? For example, if you belong to Rotary, should it be there? Or Rotract, um, Full Gospel, Businessmen's Fellowship, should you put the pin there at a business meeting? Should you enter a business meeting wearing a jacket with a pin which has your favorite team? In my case, Arsenal. Supposing the person you're going to have the meeting with is a Spurs fan, a Chelsea fan. Vests, singlets, gentlemen, do you know that you're not supposed to leave your top button undone so that your singlet shows like this? Did you know that? You should never, ever show, ever. Ties, do you know how to knot a tie? Do you know that when you take off a tie, you should undo that knot? Some men, 
and they will, they will explain to you quite frankly that they don't know how to tie their knots well. When they take off the tie, they leave it knotted. Do you know what happens? You get a line on your tie and it's a, it's a line of dirt. And professionals, experts in these things will see it at once. Socks, these days a lot of you young people are wearing bright socks, so bright that they hurt my eyes when I, when I see them. I tend to, to prefer plain black with a tiny splash of color. But now colorful socks are coming into vogue. Wherever you're going for the interview for your job, ask yourself, are they conservative? Can I wear bright pink socks? Can I wear hooped blue and green socks? Or should I wear something completely conservative? You want that job, so you must adapt. Now, all these things can let you down badly. Ladies, for example, do you know how many buttons that a lady may leave unbuttoned at the top? In case you're wondering, it's two. Usually no more than two if you have buttons, okay? Should a woman going to wear, can she wear a mini skirt and show cleavage? Yes, but not together. These are all little things. A, a woman shouldn't go to work showing cleavage and wear a short skirt or dress as well. It should be one or the other. Armpit hair. In Ghana, we don't approve of it. If you're going to wear a sleeveless top, gentlemen, ladies, and your armpit is bulging with hair like Tina Turner's head, be careful. Body odor. How do you sit in an office with somebody who has bad body odor or a mouth odor? How do you tell them? Your exposed flesh, how much is suitable for the office? Tattoos. Ghana is so conservative, or so we would say anyway. Can you wear a tattoo to the office in Ghana? Makeup, nails, all these things are so relative. You work in a company, you see somebody whose makeup is like she shoveled it on with a whole shovel, and you're wondering, how do I tell her that that's a little too much? But in makeup, it's all so relative. How much is too much? Okay, eyebrows. Business, you find shapes in eyebrows, even for men. Is it acceptable in the office? All of them are relative and their potential potholes. Perfume, a wonderful thing for both men and women, but you can overuse it. Your accessories, your shoes, your bags, your belt. So all I'm saying about grooming is that groom yourself properly and the chances of success are greatly increased. You look good, your self-esteem and confidence are sky high and people just glance at you and think, wow. So that's one thing you've taken care of, your grooming. A little thing that's so important. Now let's talk a little bit about basic communication. That's another key, basic communication. I have a definition which is very personal, but I'll share it with you. Basic communication to me is the need for a message properly organized with a swiftly delivered point, powerfully declared. The need for a message, that means you have something to say. If you don't have anything to say, with all due respect, shut up. It's the best way to communicate when you have nothing to say. Properly organized, what you are saying must flow from beginning to end chronologically or in terms of its content. With a swiftly delivered point, this is a very personal thing with me. People who speak slowly sometimes are at a disadvantage. In a meeting where people are being asked to make their points and people are speaking faster than you, you may be held back. Think about that. With a swiftly delivered point, those of you who will end up in careers in, let's say, the media, you need to speak fast. You need to learn how to speak fast and when to speak fast. It's important. And the last part of that sentence, powerfully declared, Look at the pastors in this country. Why do you think churches have such wonderful um, attendance? They declare their messages powerfully so people listen. And you must be the same in your basic communication. Don't think that, well, I'm not a good, I'm not a pastor, so I don't need to declare uh, anything powerful. You lie bad, you do. Whether it's looking for um, a job, whether it's uh, giving a girl rap soup, you need to declare powerfully, believe me, you really do. Now, don't forget that, Good communication creates good relationships. How you speak, the words you choose, and mastery of the language get you what you want, and they give you power. Now, I'm an Achimota. Throughout my life, I've been told I'm elitist. I brought for some. But when I speak, I get people asking me, are you an Achimota? Why is that? Because I know what I am saying. And I have chosen to practice and make myself a master of the language as far as I can. Nobody is perfect. How you speak, the words you choose, and the mastery of the language gets you what you want and give you power. Look, when you go to a company for an interview, let me tell you, after you've left, HR will probably go to reception and ask them, this guy came here, how was he? And if you made an impression with the way you spoke at reception, they will say, oh, he spoke very well indeed. Okay, so know, know how to speak. By the way, whenever you enter an organization and you are employed there, know who speaks for your organization. It's not always the CEO, but find out so you know who to, to uh, point out. And as part of basic communication, you need to know how to structure email, memos, reports, briefs. 
you need to know how to structure them so they are read by people who receive massive amounts of these things so that yours will stand out. Social media. When the, if you join the firm and you have to use social media for the firm, you have to ask yourself, does everybody understand the um, abbreviations I am using, the emojis? Unfortunately, social media has affected a lot of young people who now cannot communicate professionally in written uh, communication. So think about that. And now, of course, in basic communication, you need to ask yourself, are you working in the office or are you on flexible or remote time? It's a thing now. It's a thing. And there are consequences with flexible re remote time. For example, trust issues. People you don't know too well because you only know them through Zoom. Bonding issues. It's all part of basic communication. When you enter the firms that you are going to enter, do you have a card? How do I get to know you when I see you? Does that company use cards? And by the way, don't forget that English may not be our first language. And therefore, we will meet people who speak English better than us. Learn from them. And then when you meet somebody who doesn't speak English as well as you, learn how to be able to speak to that person who sees English as a foreign language. Shorter sentences, no big words. Waiting for the person to compose a response before they speak. And all these things in basic communication will help you with your CV and your personal profile. The next key, corporate writing. Now, a lot of people speak to me about writing. As um, Gillian told you, I have a blog. I'm not a writer, but I do blog. And people are just scared of writing. They are told to write a report, an assessment, a project. And they see it as a huge unattainable goal. Why? Me, yeah, I can't write too. I don't have rap, so these big words, I don't know how to put them. On. But you have to. You do not have a choice. It's as simple as that. So make sure that corporate writing in particular does not become a huge unattainable goal in your mind. Trust and believe in yourself. It's basic advice from me. Trust and believe in yourself and write your story. Know that I use the word story, whether you're writing an email, a brief, a memo, a report, a project assessment, whatever, write it like you are writing a story. Why? Because stories are interesting. Who wants to read um, a report when you can read a story? Turn your report into a story. Now, one advice I can give you about your corporate writing and before you enter the corporate world, have a trusted feedback system. I have one person in particular who I send things to if I'm not sure that. Could you have a look at this for me? If you are in an office, wherever you are, send have that one person. And I say trusted because sometimes the things you are writing are confidential. You don't need a feedback system of somebody who's going to read what you have written and go and tell them, Charlie, do you know what Rami told me to look at the other day? Trusted feedback system, it always helps, okay? Be clear when you write. What you're writing should say something about your message, about you and the person who's going to read it. Be concise, you don't have to use too many words. Learn how to use paragraphs, comments, semicolon. How many of you use the semicolon? Seriously, the colon. Find out about them and use them. Business letters, when you're writing them, do you know how to end? If you start a letter with, dear Mr. Beatty, how do you end it? The answer is you end with, yours sincerely. If you start with dear say, with no name, then you end with yours faithfully. Know these things so that you look professional when you're writing to apply for a job or with a new project, whatever, bank loan. Spelling, keep your spell check on on your laptops or your phones or wherever. Proofreading, learn how to proofread your own work. Okay, so in short, in corporate writing, be sincere, be tasteful, be thoughtful, be appreciative, be apologetic when you have to be, and be culturally sensitive. You don't write to a Muslim man and wish him um, Christ has risen, happy Easter. Okay, you don't write to a, a, um, a man and woman who have not had a child yet and say, by the way, happy Mother's Day. Culturally insensitive. It's part of good communication and it's a key. So poor writing may actually indicate a lack of attention to detail and maybe carelessness in decision making. And this is from the person who's reading what you have written. You may not be there to defend yourself. If you can't communicate what you want or need, you're not going to get what you want. And you are creating an impression. All your CVs, all your personal profiles, they will get there without you being there. You, a word to the wise. Another key is public speaking. Now, before you throw up your hands again and say, I can't speak, it's normal to be scared. But unfortunately, you need to be seen and you need to be heard. You need to be seen and you need to be heard, wherever you are job hunting, career, whatever, you need to be seen, you need to be. So channel your fear into that need. What kind of voice do you need in um, public speaking? You need a soothing, strong, sure voice. Think about that. Soothing, because you want to be calm. Strong, because you want the person to believe you. Sure, because you need to be sure that what you're saying, the facts are true. 
if you are a radio DJ presenting a show and you announce a song, and you mention the title and the artist, we believe you because you are the authority. Your voice must be sure. And it applies wherever. Your pitch, your volume, learn how to bring your voice down. Learn how to raise it. Pronunciation of names, of common words, and but especially of names. You don't enter a company and say, um, I was asked to come and see uh, Mr. Biaiti. And the person at the desk says, oh, you mean Mr. Beatty? And you say, whatever. And it happens. You need positive body communication, minimal gestures, and use your hands, but very, very slightly. If you're speaking at a formal place, do you know how to use a microphone? Does it have a cord? Is it attached to your back, to your head? When you're speaking in public, when you're speaking in front of an audience, do you move or not? What is there? What is going to obstruct you? Do you know what filler words are? Also important. Filler words are when you say, um, uh, like, so you use them so often that they're not even words anymore and they are filling the space and you look like you're not confident and you're not sure. Analyze your audience in public speaking, whether it's an interview panel or a one-on-one. -on -one. Connect with them and show them that you care, okay? Connect. Interviews, so important. These days they are conducted in social settings. You may get an invitation to join uh, the panel of this company at your hotel and they're having a drink. And when you get there, how do you look? Will you drink or not? Will you sit, will you swing your legs or not? Will you stare? Your mannerisms, ladies, batting your eyes could be misinterpreted, chewing your nails, the neck stretch. You don't do all those things in public, okay? And it's all part of public speaking. The next key, listening. Such an important thing, such an important thing. There are, there's a difference between hearing and listening. When you hear, your brain has told you that there's a sound and you have heard it. When you listen, you are paying attention and analyzing what you have heard. Now, one of the problems we have as human beings is showing that we are listening. Do we always need to show? Do we always need to, what they call a bubble head? That's when you nod all the time or shake all the time. And, hey, yes, look at me, I'm interested in what you're saying. Is it necessary? Do you have to do that all the time? In some cases, maybe, but not always. Let me tell you the five types of listening very briefly that exist. There's pseudo listening, which is when you pretend to be listening. Appreciative listening, where you are actually enjoying what is being said, it's likable and it's appealing to you. Empathetic listening, you connect emotionally, you grasp the situation, okay, that's empathetic. Comprehensive listening, you interpret the words and ideas, you listen to, for example, instructions and maybe directions. And then the final one, critical listening, where you evaluate and analyze and far more, it is far more active than the first four. To be a good listener, you need patience. You need to have real curiosity. You can only cultivate this with practice. So why should somebody listen to you? Well, you must be interesting. You must be interactive. You must handle disturbances and interruptions perfectly. And of course, you should be backed with a good character, exemplary conduct, concern, knowledge, insight, focus on others. All those things will make people listen to you. And especially when they see that you are a good listener. And please, the number one thing about listening, if it's in a formal setting, your mobile phone, yeah, ready? I cannot say this enough for young people, mobile phones, preferably on silent when you have to listen, preferably out of sight, because if it's on the table in front of you and it rings or it buzzes or a light flashes, you will look at it and the person will say, you're not listening to me. And that's one of the reasons that people will not listen to you when your ego and your own ideas and your own self-importance shine through. You don't want that. You don't want that. Okay, the last three. The first is online etiquette. What are we doing now? We are online, right, on Zoom. Basically, it's the same as face-to-face. -face. And the whole point of Zoom, as with face-to-face, -face, is to do what? Create a favorable first impression, a very favorable first impression. If you're career hunting, you need this. Now, don't forget that uh, online existed before the pandemic, and it's not going away. It will continue. So therefore, you need to adjust and adapt to what many will call a jarring transition. Reinvent yourself. Don't say that, hey, online, I, mean, I can't do it. Get used to handling, for example, people speaking over you. It even happens face to face. How much more online? Oh, you go first. Oh, no, you go first. How do you handle that? Okay. And therefore, for example, with that one, you, you, you need to learn how to pause slightly every time you speak. The background, I mean, if you look at mine, for example, it's not exceptional. It's just the curtains in my office. You can see my AC switch over there. But you can see my face, and that's the main thing. And hopefully, that is what you are focusing on. 
that your background can be active, it can be static, but if it's alive, for example, are there people moving around? Why are they there, even at home? Ask yourself, okay, a camera level, okay? You must always make sure that your face is fully on screen, nothing like this, where maybe, you know, the top of your head is gone, or maybe right down there, where you can see my AC, you must be sure that you can see the person's face and there's no problem with that, okay? That's part of online etiquette. And don't forget, with online, the corporate and social rules are a bit different. Introductions, what you might have done face-to-face, -face, you're now doing online. When you're leaving a meeting, you must inform, okay? Strangers in a meeting, how do you meet them? Should there be time for ice breaking? That might help. And of course, unmuted devices while you're online, your mobile phone, a sound system, a landline, Okay, the security is important. The system they are using, can it be hacked? I'm sure you've all heard horrendous stories of people hacking meetings and starting to broadcast pornography. Seriously, it happens. And timekeeping, please. The fact that you're online doesn't mean it's okay to be late. To. It's not. Please, it is not at all. Okay, it's not okay to be late online. And don't forget with online as well, humor is so important. Jokes that you can crack face to face and that will work may not quite work Sorry, we are, we are going to um, another one that's, okay, we'll come to, to that briefly. I'm winding down now. Jillian, just a few more minutes. Work-life balance. This is the ninth one of the 10th. Now, we all have stress in life. Fully stress, like driving in Accra. That's fully stress for me. You, the young people, may have stresses like the labor market, somebody wanting to take your job, your future, and now, of course, social media. So how do you achieve a work-life balance with this kind of stress? I know one grandma, her de-stressor is her grandchild. She says when the child comes to her, she's a terror. She makes a run up and down, but by the time she's leaving, she has distressed. okay? So unfortunately, some people go the wrong way. When I say the wrong way, smoking, alcohol, pornography, gambling, those are all de-stressors, but going down a very bad path. So your career success is gonna depend on your work-life balance as well. I use my blog to de-stress. I also DJ from time to time. Yes, even at my age. Some of us, of course, religion, we go to God first. Now, if you're lucky to have your job, your passion as your job and you are paid for it, God bless you, that's just incredible. If not, find a passion so you can achieve some kind of work-life balance. There's no perfect sync between work and life, it doesn't work. There's always a compromise on both sides, okay? So it's not about the time that you're spending on work and life, but being fully present and engaged in each of them. That's the main thing. So measure your success at home at work, and work by the amount of quality and interrupted experiences. Let me give you the seven keys within that key that I use for work-life balance. I put God first, number one. Two, routine medical checks, always. Three, eat right. That's difficult, I know. Exercise, again, difficult. Five, have fun, laugh at yourself. Yourself first. Six, sleep well. Again, at my age, I'm struggling with that. And the seventh one is love. Now this one is controversial. When I say love, what do I mean? Friends, family, well, it's up to you to sort out where that love. Again, don't go down the wrong path of love. And finally, work-life balance is a cycle, not an achievement. Note that, a cycle, not an achievement, okay? So down to the very last key, the 10th one. This is the final one, and it's humor. We all laugh. We all enjoy a good laugh. We enjoy being with friends, family, watching a good movie. The, the movie I said was my favorite movie. It's a comedy. But do you know how to tell a joke? Do you know when to pause in a joke? Do you know when not to tell a joke? Do you know how to use your face? Now, you may tell me that this is not key to your career, but let me tell you, when you go for an interview and you are sitting outside the interview room and somebody has entered before you, and during that person's interview, you keep hearing waves of laughter, you will start asking yourself, why are they laughing so much? Do I have any jokes? Can I tell any jokes? You might think about it then. So you may, th you may think that it's, it's not important. It is. It is. And sometimes, sometimes the humor you use in any situation may, defect, may deflect from a problem, from a flaw that you have. But you need to know how to tell jokes. You need to know how to use your face. Again, the mastery of the language will help. Okay, when not to tell a joke, how to react when your, your joke falls flat, as in you tell a joke and nobody minds you, nobody laughs, what do you do? It's humor, it's a small thing, but it is so important because when somebody gets it right, people who you are speaking to will never forget you. I used to be at Joy FM many years ago, 
I still get people telling me jokes that I told 20 years ago. I kid you not. Complete strangers. I meet them and they say, oh, Rami, you're the one who was on the um, Weekend City show. You once said so and so and so. And I don't even remember that joke. So please, if you want to be good with humor, practice. So those are my 10 keys. Little things, time management, manners and courtesy, grooming, basic communication, corporate writing, public speaking, listening, online etiquette, work-life balance, and humor. You get all these things right and you don't even have to look at them again. And ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, you are the brand. Wherever you end up, as you exist now, you are your brand. When you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror, that is your brand looking back at you. When you go and join an organization, wherever you go, if you go to, if you end up at Data Bank, which would be a solid place to work, if somebody says to you, Data Bank crowd, what is your brand? Ask you yourself, what are you presenting to that person? What are they seeing as you stand in front of them? Your grooming, your manners, your courtesy, your writing, that is their brand. Whatever Data Bank will tell you their brand exists for, the color, the whatever, whatever, you are the brand. When you look in the mirror in the morning, you are going to define your own success because what you see in the mirror is what everybody else sees. And it is so important. So, so, so work-life balance. Imagine you've had a fight with your wife, your girlfriend, and you're going out to go and work with a face like this. That's the brand for the day. And it's not so good, is it? Thank you very much. Jillian. Thank you so much, Ravi. Honestly, I've been getting messages um, on the side through the chat with people saying that they could listen to you all day. Um, <laughs> and everybody is just very, very grateful for the tips that you have shared. Honestly, there are some things that they say you learn something new every day. And there are a few things that you said that I myself didn't know. So I'll have to follow up with you okay. for um, more advice especially the whole bit about ending the letter. And if it's yeah. dear Mr. Beatty versus dear sir, yeah. um, how do you end that? That, that was an interesting point. Okay. So um, in the interest of time, okay. let me open it up for questions. We will try and take about five questions and then we'll see how we manage the time. So I'll ask anyone who has a question to either raise your hand, Prince, I see your hand, or put your question in the chat. We will answer some now. And then those that we are not able to answer, we'll have another question and answer session after um, Kojo speaks, so that we can answer it there. And if we get too many questions and we can't answer all, then we'll get you the answer after um, the program. So let me start with Prince. Prince, I am asking you to unmute yourself and then ask your question. Please go ahead. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Rami. Uh, much happy about how you believe it and God bless you for that. But Thank my you. question is, when, when we are talking, you talked about manners and kites. Yes. So my question here is, when you are going for a work interview and your HR asks you, how much money will you take in that case, how are you going to answer this question? So that's my question. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, there is no correct answer to that uh, question. There are things you can say like, I expect to be compensated adequately at that level for the work that I do. It's vague, isn't it? You haven't said anything. If you are lucky, you'll be able to get the HR person to make the first offer, if you're lucky depending on how good the HR person is also at speaking. If they make an offer, let's say 5,000, the HR person knows that they can go to 10,000, but they say 5,000 first. How are you gonna answer? Are you, gonna ex are you going to get excited and say, oh, Charlie, 5,000, I've never had 5,000 in my life. Oh yes, please, thank you very much. The HR person is gonna go away and the MD is gonna congratulate the HR person, the HR person for taking somebody they were prepared to pay 10,000 and paying 5,000. So you can start, first of all, you should do your um, research before you go. Any interview, do your research. If you have friends in that company, even better. Find out about salary levels and for that level, et cetera, et cetera. And then try and make them make the first offer. How? Knowing when to keep quiet. When they say something, sometimes you can smile and not say anything and look at them. And if you're lucky, the HR person, when they say 5,000, they say, well, maybe 6,000. 
There's an interesting story from years back in the 80s, Microsoft, when apparently an HR person wanted to hire somebody, spoke to the person who was highly valued and offered them $25,000 a year. This was in the 80s. The person was just quiet and he smiled. The HR person said, well, $25,000. And the person just smiled. And the HR person said, okay, we can go as high as 30,000. And the person just smiled and smiled again. And the HR person said, $30,000, that's not bad for your level, you know, entry level. Okay, we can offer you $35,000. And the person continued smiling. Wasn't rude, didn't shout, it just was just silent. They ended up at $45,000 when the initial offer was $25,000. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that can work both ways. You can keep quiet too much and they try to person and say, this guy cried to hell with him. We'll get somebody else. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We'll be in touch. So you have to be, this is why I say manners and courtesy are so important because you disarm the person by being nice. Could you enter, what does he say um, in his song? Namanane. I've melted. So when you enter a negotiation or an interview, if you are warm, if your manners and courtesy are perfect, you've begun to disarm the person. And as they are speaking, you are taking notes. You're taking note of their look, their mannerisms. Are they focused on you? Are they distracted? You can actually say things to make them feel uncomfortable. Excuse me, you don't seem to be listening to what I am saying. If the person is looking somewhere on their phone. Embarrass them, small pay. You have a slight advantage. Next thing you know, the salary has gone higher. In a nutshell, that's what I would say. Prince. Well put. Thank you, Rami. Okay, next we'll go to Suleimana. Uh, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Um, as at the time you were talking about um, when to use yours faithfully and yours sincerely, I didn't get that part. My network wasn't that good as I then. So I yes. had wanted to see if you can elaborate on it a bit for me. Okay, there's a basic way to, uh, to end a letter. These days, there are all sorts of things. My favorite one, especially by email, is kind regards. If you are doing a formal letter and you start by saying, Dear Mr. Beatty, the ending should be yours sincerely or sincerely yours when you mention a name. If you say dear sir or dear madam, the ending should be yours faithfully or faithfully yours. Now, please note, in some cases, you will see others apart from this. You will see respectfully yours. Those are fine. Those are fine. Sometimes you need to ask yourself, who am I writing to? Who's going to read this thing? Is it an older person, 50, 60 years old? They might know about this. A younger person might not. I once worked in a company where the group chief executive used to sign off emails to the company with his first initial, A dot. A dot, I mean, how many people would dare write to a senior person and end it with their first initial? A dot. It became his nickname in the company, A dot. But then of course he was a group CEO so he could do what he wanted. So stay within bounds and try and do those things, okay? Because if you go for other things like, I mean, there are, there are people I know who will actually say, peace out. I mean, that's not acceptable. I mean, peace out, seriously, you know. So just try to keep those in mind and use them as appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'll take a question from George. You can unmute yourself and ask, then I'll go to the chat and pick up a couple of questions from there. George, please go ahead. All right. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. Um, I don't know if my question is a, is a digression from the main topic, but um, let me just put it across. Um, I want to know if you are working in a toxic work environment, let's say where um, cliques are easily formed, people gossip a lot and, and rumors are running rampant in the, in the organization and you are a well-mannered person. How do you adjust yourself to fit in the, in the, work, in the work culture? How do well, you adjust first, yourself? Okay, well, first of all, toxic is always bad. It's never good. It's never good. And if you are lucky enough to sense that the environment in which you find yourself is toxic, please never lose your good manners. You will find that in a place like that, humor will help. If you become known as the person who says, Charlie, this project is difficult, but I'm going to help it go on. If you are able to come across a toxic environment and make jokes, not at people's expense, by the way, but say things that will make people laugh, you become known for it. You will find that around you, the toxicity will actually drop. And believe me, the toxic people, Charlie, they are hardcore. 
they, are, they will drag you down to their level in a way that you didn't think was possible. So that's why I said, if you are fortunate enough to realize that this yes. environment is toxic, don't lose your good manners. Don't lose any ability that you have. Maintain your composure. Sometimes you need to walk away. It's possible that on a day in a particular environment, you can actually get up and walk away, go and come back later. It is that bad and it can happen. But the best thing is you are in that job and once you are there, you must adjust yourself, see positive things, come up with humor that everybody will enjoy. You become known almost as the go-to person. If people are feeling bad and not feeling good, Charlie, ask for Ramide, he'll make you smile. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. But you need to be strong because let me tell you, the toxic people, God, they are strong and they will drag you down to a level that you didn't think that you could go to. So George, you need to be careful. Thank you very much. Jillian, any more questions? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, so I'm going to the chat and there, there are quite a number of questions and hands. We won't be able to take all immediately, but okay. um, someone asked, Someone wanted you to go over the work-life balance list. Okay. Uh, if you could just go through that okay. um, one more time, then I'll come with the next question. Okay. Now, like I said, work-life balance is a very personal thing for me because, because our stresses are different. How you handle them is different. And don't forget my last words. Work-life balance is a cycle. It goes up and down, up and down, but it goes on. Now, the seven things that I depend on in work-life balance, number one, put God first. I'm a Christian. So I put God first in, in my quiet time, which I have morning and evening. I don't go to church on Sundays, but I go to mass on Tuesdays and Fridays. And I speak to God all the time, in my car, in the shower, when I'm alone. Two, routine medical checks. Hard to tell by looking at me, but I'm a survivor of two heart attacks. Two heart attacks. I've had COVID. Last year, I had severe COVID. Okay, severe COVID. So you need to do routine medical checks. You are young now. So what you need to do is not that much. But as you go on, you need to ask yourself, ask your doctor, what tests should you do? Eat right. Again, so difficult if you like food like me. Fried foods, maybe not a good idea too often. Vegetables, yes, plenty. Fruits, yes, plenty. Eat right, speak to a dietitian. Exercise. Now I'm not saying that everybody should be able to run a marathon. But at least a bit of walking every day. If you sit at a desk every day in the office, how long do you stay seated before you get up and move around? Exercise. Have fun. And I'm not going to define fun here. It's up to you. But one of the things you should do is learn how to laugh at yourself. It's very, very extremely therapeutic. Laugh at yourself and your goofs and gaps. Okay? Six, sleep well. At my age, it's become so difficult for me to sleep because I have too much stress on my mind. And it's bad for me. I'm working at it, but I haven't achieved it yet. They say eight hours per night. I'm getting about five maximum if I'm lucky. Okay, and the seventh one, love. Now you need love in your life. Whether that love is coming from friends, family, I leave up to you entirely. I leave it up to you because it is a difficult one. Friends, family, wait, I don't know. But if you have love in your life, it helps. I've been married to the same woman for 27 years. I don't know how she uh, has been able to stand me for so long, but it helps me in my work-life balance. It definitely does. I mean, I don't see her as an object for my work-life balance, but she makes it better. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you um, there was a question. This one was directed to us at Data Bank, whether we have a program for young graduates. Um, mostly, we offer internships for anyone who is interested. Um, and then, of course, there is the national service that you can get placement. What I would recommend though, is that anyone that is interested in getting into the investment industry, you focus on, you begin um, the stock exchange course that is required as part of our industry certification. It's something that many young people, Rami, I find, they're so fo focused on school that yeah. they never stop to check whether the industry they want to go in actually has other requirements for getting hired. So right. it, it's a good question. Um, if you increase your chances of getting into any program with any company, if you also look at the industry requirements and the professional courses, and it's always good to start it if you can while you're in school, because then it shows some extra initiative as well. 
Um, so Rami, back to you. The question is, the next question is, I'll ask you to quickly, how does one keep balance between the grasp of language? For example, um, English versus maintaining a unique native accent. So they want to know how to balance that. That's one question. Um, second question is, what is the best way to turn down job offers without damaging relationships? And that question is in two parts in the sense that um, Okay, so there's damaging, how to turn on job offers without damaging relationships. And then what, if you are asked the reason that you left your old job and you had a bad experience, how do you respond? So uh, there are three questions I've asked you. Um, yeah. The first is balancing your holding on to your local tongue, um, but still speaking the English language. Second is turning down job offers without damaging relationships. And third is, what if you're asked in an interview, why did, you, why did you leave your old job and you actually left because of a bad experience? How do you respond? Well, with the first one, um, I've been fortunate with that. I've never lost my accent as it is. I speak Fanti in English. And over the years, especially when I was doing radio, it was quite interesting to meet people for the first time, introduce myself, and they would say, oh, you're white. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not white, but why are you saying that? Well, you sound Ghanaian on the radio. Now, all I can say is that I never made a conscious effort to acquire an accent. As you all know, Ghanaians, hmm, he left small. There are people who do Lafa. I think you know Lafa, locally acquired foreign accent. It's a pity because the Ghanaian accent to me is fine. Do you, does anybody remember the UN Secretary General, um, Kofi Annan? Kofi Annan never lost his accent. You could close your eyes and fall asleep and he would speak and you know that that's a Ghanaian, that's a brother from here. Okay, he never lost his accent. His English was perfect. This is the UN Secretary General. He never lost his accent. So all I can say is that maintain your accent. Don't lose it. Now, we live in a strange world now where they say that if you apply for certain jobs in the Western world and your name sounds black, you won't get the job. You need to have a black, a, a white sounding name. Maybe, I don't know. But I find that having the accent helps me. It maintains my identity. I feel like I'm Rami, this is the way I speak. The mastery of the language is far more important. It's far more important to be able to be eloquent. It's far more important to be able to speak English and use words that the person will not only hear, but will say, wow, I've never heard it put quite that way. And one of the things I use for that is reading. I read nonstop. I prefer fiction anyway. I don't like uh, nonfiction. There's too much going on in the world. I prefer to escape. But by reading, I'm always coming across new words a new turn of phrase, and use something that I can use. So maintain your accent. Don't ever lose it. Keep it as it is. Trevor Noah, the South African comedian, has a good joke where he tells about when he was leaving South Africa to go to the States to go and do the daily show. People would meet him in the streets and say, hey, Trevor, Trevor, don't lose your accent. You hear, man? If you lose the accent, don't come back to South Africa. It was funny. But he's maintained it. He's also kept his accent. So keep it. Please, I beg you, keep whatever uh, local language you speak, Speak it and let it uh, roll over into your um, English. The second one, job offers, basic manners and courtesy. You receive a job offer. If you are fortunate enough to get another one that is better, you decide to go for that one. First of all, respond. Don't just leave it. Respond. Respond and in as nice a way as possible, tell them that you received the offer, you are grateful for it. However, another opportunity has come up that is maybe a bit more focused on your interests. Therefore, you thank them very much indeed. You, you might even want to add a line about, I hope we can maintain this relationship. That's a little forward, but it's not bad. You're letting them know that, hey, friends, friends for life. I'm going elsewhere, but I hope that next time if there's anything we can speak. Okay, so you might, I mean, like I said, basic manners and courtesy. Hello, please, thank you, sorry. So nice. That way they will remember, believe me, there are HR people who will remember you for that letter and they'll come back to you at some point in the future, you never know, for a higher position and more money, always important. The third one, why you left a previous job and if it was a bad reason, I believe in the truth. Unless the truth is gonna cause you to have problems in this job. Let's say you are female. Let's say you left your previous job because of sexual harassment by a senior person. 
What are you going to say at an interview? Maybe you might want not to use the words sexual harassment. You might say, I received attention from a senior colleague that was too close. It bordered on the offensive, mastery of the language. But I believe in the truth. Now, if, you're, if it's, let's say, for money, you have to be careful how you say it. You can't just say, I left because I wanted more money. Yeah, we all do. Okay, but then it means that you are a money person. It means that if you join us and somebody makes you a higher offer, you are going. So you could say something like, I put in a lot of time at my old company. I was very loyal. I put in a lot. The compensation was not quite up to scratch. I could barely keep my nose above level. And I found myself concentrating on my salary rather than on the job at hand. I believe I can do better in this job. You've said it nicely, but it's the truth. It's the truth. Now, it's easier to speak the truth and move on. Because if you go and tell some horrendous lie, down the line, if you join that company, and something crops up which is connected to that lie, and you start to fumble, because you and God, then you are in deep, deep trouble. Gillian. Thank you. OK, so there are so many questions, but I will take one last one from Robert in the, I'll let him unmute himself and ask his question. We will pause on the questions, not forget about them, but just pause on them so that we give away a few prizes, as I promised, and then um, take the next presentation. Then we will come back and have one more question and answer session. So if you haven't had a chance, um, you can put your question in the chat for those of you who have raised your hands so that you don't forget. And then we'll, I'm happy to read them out as we go. So Robert, please unmute yourself, ask your question, and then we'll move on to the next step. Robert, are you there? Okay. Um, Robert, I am going to count down three, two, one, because I maybe you're having an issue on muting. So let me just move to Emmanuel Kumi. Emmanuel, please unmute yourself and then ask your question. Thank you. Okay. Thank. Thank you very much. Um, I quickly want to find out about those of us who love to keep our hair and our beard uh, during job interviews. Is it compulsory we need to cut, cut it down completely or at least put it in a nice shape? Because uh, in our society, when you go for a job interview, people seem to look at you as if maybe you are rude or something like that. Meanwhile, uh, we just love to keep our hair and our beard. We have to cut it down completely or just in a good shape. Thank you. Okay, well, the good shape, definitely. For example, if you have an Afro, and an Afro is not bad if you decide to have an Afro, but it should be neat. It should not have straggly hairs sticking out all over the place. It should be neat. Definitely keep it neat. Concerning things like facial hair, like I said, if you're going for an interview with a company, you need to do some research. Find out. I once worked at a bank where you had to be shaved. We were not allowed to keep a beard of any sort. Even a mustache, I think you have to keep it very, very low. Some companies don't care. I worked in a, another company after that one, and it was a bit of a shock because everybody was feeling free. Beards, mustache, I mean, big ones. But at least neat. So if you have a beard, my suggestion to you is trim it. If you feel it's okay to go for the interview with it and that they keep it at that company, fine, no problem there. But at least trim it and make it neat. If you can't do it yourself, I, su I suggest you visit um, a men's salon. Have it trimmed for you so that you look neat. If down the line you discover that that company, everybody keeps their beard on, it doesn't matter the length and so on, so be it. Then you can also do that. But once you are looking for the job, neatness is imperative. It's important. But find out before you. Jillian. Awesome. Um, actually, I'm going to sneak in one last question and then um, we'll, we'll move to Kojo. No, we'll move to the giveaways. Just somebody said, um, one, they see you are a person of love, especially when you mentioned Kojo entry. <laughs> and you mentioned kissing and hugging at the workplace. The person's question is, with our culture, how do we practice this and not have it misinterpreted or misunderstood? Yeah, 
Well, one of the things to do when you are joining a company for the first time is observe. From your first day, start observing. I mean, if you're sitting at the reception on the first day, a lady walks in, she says, hello. Her colleague walks in, Emil, and he says, hey, I'm a long time old. And he hugs and kisses her on the cheek. It doesn't mean that you can do that. That's your first day. Observe, do people hug and kiss? How many kisses? Who are those who kiss? Are they on the same level? Higher people, lower people? Just observe. So it is very wise to observe because you may be coming from a culture where the people hug and kiss freely. It may not be done at the place that you are. If you see that the guys give uh, high fives or a fist bump, you might start with that. If you see that the ladies are doing the same, that people don't hug and kiss, don't do it. You just observe, that's all. And when you have observed the culture, when I say observe about a month or two down the line, you can start to enter that culture freely. Otherwise, if you meet somebody, go with the handshake, go with the fist bump. If you see that they hug and kiss freely, everybody does it, fine, then you can try. Even then, I would suggest that you, you try tentatively. If you see that as a man, for example, you are moving forward to hug the woman and she's going backwards, stop, don't disgrace yourself. Okay, but watch the culture and don't assume that what they are doing, you can do immediately. You give it a bit of time and it should work out. Gillian. You are muted, Gillian. You are muted. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I thank you so much for your answers. And I just based on the feedback and all the questions that are coming in and the rapt attention of those on video, I can tell that this is very useful. So we do have a few giveaways. And um, so let me just ask a few questions and then we'll give away a few prizes, then we will move on. So I hope that everybody has been listening. I am going to ask three questions um, for now. And for each one, you will need to put your answers in the chat. So the first person to get to type the correct answer in the chat will get the prize. Okay, so we'll start small. This one will be for 20 CDs airtime. Um, for actually two people. So I will take the first two people who get the correct answer for this. Each of you will get 20 CDs airtime. So I hope you have fast fingers. All right, hold on. Let me open up my chat so I don't miss anyone. Okay. Somebody's already typing the answer. <laughs> I haven't <laughs> asked the <a> question. <laughs> Okay, so question number one is, um, okay, what, what Rami gave 10 points uh, when he was speaking, and I would like to know what was the first point that he gave and the last point that he gave. Somebody's already answered. <laughs> Uh-huh. Alex, I see one by oh, oh okay, okay, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so I the asked first the first and last. Yeah, one was so let me, say. Uh let me go all the way back up. Okay, time. So I'm looking for two. They um Chachu Agbator, who said time management and humor, correct? So you get 20 CDs. Um, then hold on, let me go down next, next, next. Mm. Gloria. No, okay. Um, next is Anna. Anna, Junior Ouso Agbe. So he also answered correctly time management and humor. So you get, both of you get 20 CDs um, of airtime. Put your name and phone number in the chat, please, so that we'll just verify and then someone will send you. Um, the 20 CDs. Okay, next question. Um, and this one is for a 50 CD gift voucher. So you can stop answering the first question because now we're moving on to the next one. Okay. Um, hold on. I've got it. All right. Hmm, this one is a little bit tough. So, in point number seven, about 
listening. That was a, that was the tip. Tip number seven. Rami spoke about listening, paying attention to your audience, analyzing what you have heard. Then he gave five kind. Hey, <laughs> it's already there. He gave five kinds of listening, and I wanted the five. Um, so I see the two answers. So the first one goes to Theophilus Kumi. Um, yes, he said, pseudo listening, appreciative, empathetic, evaluative, and critical. And then the second one went to, one second. Uh, I saw it was a lady. Persia Abwaji. So Theophilus and Persia is great. You guys were listening. That's awesome. Well done. Uh, put your and uh, put your name and phone number in the chat and then we will get back to you. So that's the second question. Last question and then we move on to the next section is um, okay. This one is for, let me tell you what the prize is. This is for a 100 CD gift voucher from Data Bank. In the next section, I'll give you a 100 CD shopping voucher, but this one is a 100 CD investment voucher. And um, okay, so the question for this one is, I am going to tell you what he said, and all you have to do is put which tip it refers to. <laughs> Rami, I'm sorry, you know, so people are sending the messages in. Some of them are coming directly to me, so not everyone can see them. But somebody has listed all your points <laughs> already. So any question that I thought of answering, they've already you put answer. the answer there. <laughs> but okay, let, let me still let me still ask my question and then um, you do. So Rami used these points to describe uh, this tip. He spoke about still needing to create a favorable first impression needing to learn how to pause, making sure that your face is fully on screen, camera level, um, informing people, thank you. Kukwa and Kansa, it's online etiquette. Awesome, 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 awesome. So Kukwa, please put your details in the chat. Thank you very, very, very much. Okay, so now we have one more presentation. Rami, thank you so much for- this part, I am so grateful. And now we will move over to the other, the second presentation, which is equally important because to everybody on this call, it, it you know, they're, they're, you need a career, you need a job. And when you get that job, you need to grow it, to build on it, to move up. So that's what Rami treated. Now, when you get your pay, the question becomes, what do you do with the money? How do you manage it? How do you balance it? How do you get that money to grow as well? And that is what we are here to talk about today. And the person who will be speaking about that is Databank's CEO, Kojo Adai Mensa. Um, some of you may know him already, but for those of you who don't, he has had, I think, over now about 23 years in the banking and financial services sector. Um, avid football fan, um, Liverpool. So enemy of Arsenal, likely. <laughs> um, but avid, avid football player, football fan and football player. Uh, he loves public speaking. He is passionate about education, all things education, just like his father, who is former vice chancellor of <laughs> Legon. And um, he is just actually a wealth of information when it comes to investing. So I'm really, really happy to introduce Kojo Adai Mensa to the group. Kojo, over to you. There's a bright light behind you that's it's making you look pop. very angelic. It suddenly popped up. I don't know where okay. it came from. It, but it's I've okay, done, we can see you. I've done all my online etiquette checks. So 
I this this just popped up, honestly. Ah, it okay. like this. Um, maybe the sun just got brighter. Yeah, maybe the sun just uh, shone through. But uh, yeah, at least you can see the Liverpool on the other side. That that's yes. it. <laughs> it's so always very you. difficult to to speak after somebody like Rami. It's not it's not easy at all. I mean, Rami after capturing the audience like that, um, I ask myself, hey, am I going to be able to keep them uh, engaged like you have? But thank you very much, Rami. Yes, you are now more than a part of the family. It's strange how um, Rami and I have developed our friendship. It's it's really strange. And we've just grown closer and closer for some strange reason. And um, I'm meeting him again, probably physically, tomorrow afternoon um, for something else. So Rami, thank you so much. Before I even go into um, my, my presentation, I just want to say something. Your number one, um, point was on time and um, those my colleagues here know me and time and what my attitude towards time is and everything and um, you were so spot on because I have a mentor who had said that the difference between the rich and the poor was time and Rami like you said it is how you use your time that makes the difference between the rich and the poor and um, this thing about Ghanaians and not being at places on time, I, I never accept it, Rami. And I never accept it to the rest of you guys because I'm yet to see a Ghanaian who has missed their flight um, purposely to, 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 to London or to the US. They, they never miss a flight. So once you are not missing your flight, I don't see why you are missing your meeting times, et cetera. Um, gifts was another one and Rami you and I have been in banking for many years when you get into the financial services industry the temptation will come please don't take the bait it's not okay to take anything more than what you are paid for that's my view we say oh but it's in our culture when somebody does something for you you accept and say thank you that first thank you will translate into something else very, very quickly. And having worked in three high street banks, trust me, I know what I'm talking about. Jayla, let's get into investing. All right, um, one moment. Let me just share the screen. And while I'm sharing the screen, someone has commented on your beard and said, new year, new look. So <laughs> actually, um, so it's not New Year, new look. Um, it's it's I, I call it my COVID look. So when COVID struck um, for the best part of 19 or so months or 20 months, I didn't visit the barber. I could do this on my own with the help of the Lord. Um, this part the Lord does, and I do this part myself. Um, but I was very scared going into the barber shop. So I decided just not to touch it. And I couldn't trim it myself. I tried, it wasn't working. But um, it looked it looked different. And it, it, people also liked it. So I just decided to keep the beard for a while. But in January, I, I cut it all off. And so this is three months of, of beard so far. But I've taken Rami's tips as well, only that. I do a lot of meetings virtually and hardly do I do it on video as well. So I'm rarely seen these days. All right, thank we're you. ready for you. <laughs> the person knows me. Okay, so um, I'm just going to try and share some tips um, towards financial independence and being financially independent is being able to do what you want to do when you want to do it uh, without necessarily being um, in, in debt. It's, it's very, very important that um, we always talk about independence, but we never think about being financially independent. And I know people, and I have a slide that I'll speak to it, who have lived their entire life um, being financially enslaved, um, for want of a better word. But you, 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 are, you are lucky, blessed and uh, to be on, on this, in this meeting. And, and I think a lot of you are young. And I always say that if I had this opportunity when I was growing up, I think by now I would already be a dollar millionaire, but it's still a work in progress. And I hope by the time I retire, I will be a dollar millionaire. So I'll kick off with a quote. Um, Jillian, are you with me? Yeah. So the quote says, 
It's not how much money you make that will make you rich. It's your spending and investing habits that will determine that. And why do I say that? I think it's very easy because if you have somebody earning 500 CDs a month and you have another person earning a thousand CDs a month and the one earning 500 CDs a month is able to put 300 CDs aside every month and invest that. But the one earning a thousand CDs blows all and is able to just put 50 CDs aside every month. You would be thinking that the one earning the thousand CDs um, because they are blowing the money, maybe ostentatiously and you can visibly see it, is, is the one who, who is richer. But give it a few years. And the one who has been investing 300 CDs every month will be the richer. So never think that it is about how much you earn that makes you rich. But it is what you do with what you earn. That is what makes the difference. And we always put investing and saving um, on hold. We always postpone it because we think we are not earning enough. Well, I'm here to tell you that no matter how much you earn, start investing something and it is that habit that will take you through. That was a quote that I just needed to start off with. But tip one, you need to learn to set financial goals on paper. A lot of the time we have our, our goals in our head, we have lofty ideas in our head, but we haven't set the goals on paper. We haven't actually put what it is we want to achieve down. It's important that we put what we want to achieve down. Look, it makes a lot of difference trying to convert what is in your head on paper and keeping what is in your head in your head. You will think that you know what you're about. You will think or you know what your plan is, but try writing it down. Rami had said that um, you need to develop your writing skills. You need to uh, develop how you, you, you send your messaging across and how have you organized it. All these come into play over here as well. You need to put it on paper. Don't just keep it in some your head, in some plan, in some lofty thing. Why you start putting things on paper and getting to see it in reality, then you start realizing what it is you need to actually get to your financial goal, Julia. So when I was talking about it is what you do with the money, this was something I was pointing to. There's a difference between you want something and you need something. I can bet that I am talking to somebody right now who believes that they really need an iPhone 13 or the latest, they need it. But pause, young lady, young man, do you really need it or you just want it? There's a huge difference between what you want and what you need. And a lot of the times we would try and justify why we have spent money on something by saying we needed it, but we just wanted it. Please try and get that difference. Live within your means. Or in fact, I prefer that you live below. Living within may end up spending all that thousand and saving 50 CDs. Yes, you are probably living within your means. But how about you can realize that you can save 700 of that thousand living below so that you just get what it is you actually need and not what you just want. A lot of the time people think they need it, but they don't. They just want it. Please, anytime you're about to part with money, spend a resource, pause and ask yourself, is this a need? Or is it just a want? Is this peer pressure? Is this, I want to show people that me too, I am part of the Joneses. It's a very important question that you always need to pause to ask yourself. To date, I still do that. I always do that to the extent that people like Jillian even now tell me that it's getting too much. Could you sometimes just take something, you need it. I say, I don't need it. Anyway, so let's move on. This is crucial. At the end of every week or every month, we all say, ah, but the money, what did I do with the money? 
Have you ever, and, and now I, I've become a fan of Momo because of this. I used to do it with pen and paper. Where at the end of every day, every day without fail, because when you postpone it, you forget. Write down what you have used your money for. Write it down. Tro tro, five CDs. Coffee broke man, 10 CDs. Um, airtime, 15 CDs. Or data, 20 CDs. Call this security man tip at the bank, 10 CDs. Policeman, two CDs, whatever. Have you written it down? When you start writing it down, you start seeing where it is that your money is going. Have you been putting things into your wants? The 30 there, are you really putting it into an investment vehicle, proper investment vehicle? Are you putting it into your needs, essential things that you really can't do without? You know, there are some things obviously you can't do without. So you need them. Where is your money going? Are you, have you drawn the budget? Are you sticking to the budget? You need to do this. It's extremely important that you put it down. And, and the reason I was saying I'm using Momo a lot is now it helps because every transaction is recorded. You have the option to put what it is you use for you. So there's, there's, there's no way you would even miss out on anything. And you don't necessarily have to be holding cash here and then lose change. You're not able to figure out where it's lose change. So it's to, to date, I will do it to know where the money is going. You need to know and stop telling yourself, Ghana, there is a magic place. Oh, and by all means, you, you, by the time the month has ended, you don't even know what you've used the money for. You know what you've used the money for. You haven't written it down. Write it down, figure it out, and please, as much as possible, that 20% pie, if you can move it towards 50, is fantastic. Always try and move that 20% pie, that green pie is what you have to target to increase. And it will help you in your own future, Jillian. Debt. I don't know how many of you even have started work, but I see young men starting life with debt. I am here to inform you that if you start life with debt, you are unlikely. I didn't say you won't but you are unlikely to get out of it in your entire career. And we have seen examples. We are today doing this virtually, but when we go around physically to do some of these seminars, we get uh, uh, testimonies of people who would come and confess to us that, you know, when they started life, they took some small loan, they thought, oh, it would be okay, they can repay it. Then before they realized something happened, so they couldn't pay that loan. So they had to take another loan to pay off the first loan and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. There are some debts that are not necessary. Yes, there are some debts that honestly speaking, yeah, you will have no choice. A mortgage is a necessary debt. If you have gone for a mortgage, you can afford, that's a house. Bottom line, that uh, asset can always pay back the debt if push comes to shove. But people, I'm going to say a controversial thing, but I'll say, why do you borrow to go and marry? The young men and women of today, we borrow and start marriage life in debt. What is that? So if you're unable to pay, where is the underlying asset? The marriage, you have to borrow with an, a, a solid underlying asset. I'm not even a fan of borrowing uh, for a car, but maybe after you've worked about a year, yeah, then you know your finances, you know how things go, then you can determine how much of your finances can go towards repairing a, a car loan. That's an asset. Again, if you are properly insured it and or if push comes to shove and you need to pay back, the car is an underlying asset that can be sold to, to repay. So please, Going into debt is a very, 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 very risky thing. And I'm not saying debt is bad, but it has to be something that you can use for something that is lasting. That is my advice. Growing up, 
honestly, um, I, I was not using debt to acquire things that you how those household items and no, you can prepare towards it. You know, I, 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 and again, I'll sound controversial again. People will say, oh, but I went and borrowed to go to school. It is good for somebody who is so passionate about education, who says I would disagree with you uh, going uh, to school or uh, furthering your education. But does it have to be this year, this year, by all means, so because of that, you go and borrow to go, or you can plan towards it and know that in three years time, I like to go to so so and so school. The course will cost me this. So this is how much I should be putting aside so that by the time it's three years time, I'm ready, I'm prepared, I know what I need, etc. And go for it, Jillian. I can speak to this the whole day, but I'll try and quicken it up. Now you have to invest as much as you can, as early as you can. As much as you can. Please, the investment thing. Again, in, in my time, when I was young, 21, 18, I didn't know about this. I was just wasting time, blowing time. And I've said it, if I knew what I know now, I would probably be retired comfortably as a dollar millionaire. I'm telling you, because there's power in compounding, Jillian. And let's see the next slide. Why we say it is important that you invest as much as you can, as early as you can. I'll pause. Take in the slide, guys. Take in the slide. And while you are taking it in, forget about depreciation for a moment. Forget about inflation for a moment. Forget about value of the CD for a moment. Just if you can even look at it, this in terms of dollars. Just look at the numbers. And we have underneath, you can see there, we have said this is assuming an annual average interest rate of 15%. Now hear this, if you are 20 years old and you're listening to me now, and you want to have 1 million CDs by age 60, all you need to do, and the average interest rate is 15%, all you need to do is put aside 44 CDs. 44 CDs. You postpone it and say, oh, it's too early, I'm 20, let me enjoy small. Five years later, that figure is 89 CDs. That figure is 89 CDs. Now, as you grow, every five years, the thing is doubling. The thing is doubling. You are 30 years old, you want to, so even if it is dollars, let's say, and you want a million dollars, this figure is in dollars, but we are in Ghana, we earn CDs. All I will add is that because you know that we have inflationary pressures in our economy and we have depreciation pressures in our economy, if you are starting at the 89 CDs, you now, after a year or two, you should tell yourself that this 89, I need to top it up. And if you are in a formal sector, and you are in formal uh, employment. So you are paid a monthly salary. Usually at the end of the year, usually I'm not saying it happens all the time. There's some inflation adjustment in your salary. When they adjust it, please adjust your investment accordingly. This is a very powerful slide. Take it in, think about it. And if you haven't started investing, start. If you have started and you have not been topping up, continue with your top ups. If you are topping up and you know you are not topping up enough, please increase your top up amount because the older you grow, the more difficult it becomes because you haven't developed the habit at a young age and the more money you will need. But if you start early, then you need less money. Jillian. Now, this is something we try and tell even professionals like us, that you don't put all your investments into the same account, thinking that you have the discipline to be able to know that, oh, in the pot, I have 1,000 CDs, but of that 1,000 CDs, 200 of it is the house one, 100 of it is for the school fees, 200 of it is for the, ex the travel ex No, 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 no. Don't, don't go down that path. Even professionals like us do not have that discipline 
to keep it all in one account and manage it from one account. You can open several accounts. And please, I will strongly advise that you open several accounts for the different projects that you have. You open different accounts because all these that are on the screen are projects we all have. It happens to us all the time. House, funeral, travel, fees, retirement is there. Don't put everything in one account and think you can manage it from one. You can't. You cannot. Even us who are in the system for all these years, we cannot. We separate them so that we can keep the discipline. Jillian. And on the back of that, we will always have an emergency. The emergencies happen in our lifetime. From now till the day we will die ourselves, you will always have an emergency. Now, what you don't want to do is to commingle this emergency account with others because emergencies happen. Hospital, somebody rushing to the hospital, car accident, anything. So always have a separate emergency account and have the account, um, have a target amount for that emergency account. You know, depending on, you know, of course, your, your resources and what happens around you, you always have that target. It goes back to me saying, have a financial goal, have a plan, write it down. Now, when you hit that number, you don't necessarily have to keep pumping money into it over and over again. Sometimes once you hit your emergency number, then you can shift any excess that comes into something else, you know, but have that emergency account, you know, have it ready. Let's say if I, it can even be you losing your job and the rule of thumb is if you lose your job, do you have enough money set aside that you can live the same standard of living that you have for three months? That's a rule of thumb. So let's say you earn thousand CDs a month and you suddenly lose your job. Does your emergency account have 3000 CDs for you to live on till probably you get the next job. It's, it's just, these are all examples we give to help guide how you would set yours up. But everybody is different and everybody's circumstances are different, Jillian. And I, I, I don't know, uh, per the registration, what the average age is on, on the, on the, on the, on the, at, the, at the seminar in the meeting, but I dare say, maybe the average age will be 30 years. And those of you who are 30 and below are probably laughing at me right now and saying, ah, this man, Parker, what is he talking about? I'm even a student. Why are you telling me to start thinking of retirement? I have information for you. I have it. Even if you are a student, start thinking about retirement now. Yeah, Julian, it's fine, it's fine. Start thinking about retirement now. You are getting stipends. You are getting allowances. You are getting money one way or the other. Don't tell yourself that you start thinking of retirement only when you have a job. That mindset should start now. Because look at this statistic. And this statistic was in 2005. I can assure you that anecdotally, we know that that 2% is trending downwards out of every 100 Ghanaians. Only less than 2% are retiring comfortably. Though comfortable is relative. Everybody and his comfortable. But really, when you interview them, they are not comfortable. So 23% and this figure is trending upwards are continuing to work. And you guys are always saying, look at these people, they are 60, they are 65, don't leave the job market so that we too we can get job to do. Do you know why they are not leaving the job market? They are not leaving the job market because they didn't do what they had to do when they were younger. So don't get to also their stage and block for your children. And the worst one is how the majority are depending of course, on SNET, but worse, they are depending on charity, relatives, friends, tips, 
it's even not dignifying. It, 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 it's not dignifying that you have retired, you've worked for 30 years of your life, and you are now leaving the job market and depending on people. Please start thinking of retirement now. And if possible, open your retirement account, like I showed in a few slides before. It's very, very important. It's it because we see it. And in my time at GCB, I used to see it. People coming in, holding working stick. And they get shocked at what pension they are being given. This slide is showing you the average monthly pension paid out by SNIT to its beneficiaries, 957. And this thing I'm talking about is no joke. The lowest is 300. And this 300 is actually, um, is it subsidized or topped up? So if they do the actual calculation, there are people who would even be earning lower. As you saw in May 2018, it was 276. This highest monthly pension is 142,000. Now, so those of you who know math, actuarial science and all, check this out. If the lowest is 300, the highest is 142,000 and the average is 957, what is it telling you? It's telling you that more than 90% of the people are down, 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 pulling the average down. And now to make matters even worse, let me put it that way. This highest 142,000 that you are seeing was through the old um, pension law. So that one, it was not capped. But under the new pension act 766, the calculation is such that under tier one, which is net, currently it is uh, capped at 15,000. So no matter how much you earned while you were working, your pension right will not cross 15,000. It won't, no matter how much you earn, because now there's a three tier system. So after you cap at tier one, then you go for your tier two, and then there's the tier three as well. So there are different areas of the pension uh, structure right now. If you are working and you are listening to me and you on your pay slip, you are not seeing your tier two deductions, please go to your finance director or your HR and ask, why are you not being deducted for tier two? If you don't have a tier three, that one is not compulsory, but go and ask, what do I have to do to partake in the uh, pension tier three scheme? Because it has tax advantages and it has your own future advantage too. It helps because you may not have that discipline to be doing what I have advised you do every month by putting something aside from your income or salary so that at least this gives you a social net. Jillian. And always have this type of account as well. So you will see that we, 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 we give you advice on having different types of investment accounts. The emergency account is there, the retirement account is there, the project account is there. But it's also good to have a multi-purpose investment account. You have to have this. That it's, it, this is what I call the Potogum Shuegum one. You know, it, it is important that uh, uh, you, you, you get a multi-purpose investment account, which can take care of various things as well. And I will be now coming to tell you or about you know what what type of investment then you put in to what it is that you want you'll be hearing that very soon but before that this has been our bay as a country we, in my lifetime and i'm i'm half a century in my lifetime i have seen two financial crises in ghana two one happened in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, where we had cooperative bank and bank for housing and all that. Rami will know what I'm talking about. And we've gone ah, and we are back to square one. And we've had another one. 
But I find out that is because we don't have patient investors. And we don't have patient investors because we do not start early. And suddenly, when we start, we realize, hey, this one, I can't do it in five years at this with this amount. So we start getting greedy or panicking, and we start going into all sorts of schemes and all sorts of investment uh, products that we don't know what it's about. We don't know who the regulators are. We are in a hurry, so we don't even ask the question. Somebody comes to you and say, oh, you give me 100 CDs in a month's time, I can triple it for you. And then you jump onto it. You triple it the first month. You triple it the second month. The third month is vanished. Meanwhile, in the first month and the second month, you too, because they've tripled it for you and you've received the cash, you are also telling people, Charlie, the thing is good or it works, it works. You haven't, you don't have a clue who is, who is managing this, who is even regulating it, nothing. Then we fall into trouble. Then now we are going to government to say, government, you didn't this, you have to bail us out. I've seen two. And I don't want to sound like a, a, a prophet of doom, but if we are not careful, it will happen again. Already, I am aware that people are already going into shady investment schemes, especially on campuses. Things are happening online with some things that I, I have no idea how they even develop them and how people even believe in them. Please, before you put your money into a firm or invest your money into an asset, understand what the asset is. Don't listen to what somebody said. You understand it yourself. Read about it yourself and ask the necessary questions. And then you can go into it. So how do you start? First of all, you have to know how much time it is you are looking at. Is it short term? Is it a medium term? Is it a long term? In fact, if you're listening to me, I'll recommend that it, you have all these three. You have a short-term plan, you have a medium-term plan, you have a long-term plan, and then you invest appropriately towards each of these three. So you have to ask yourself, okay, why am I doing this? Is it just you know long-term? Long-term will normally be the beautiful house you see there, medium-term maybe the car, Short term will be maybe to you know acquire one or two things, yeah. But have this time frame with you. Then you ask yourself, what is my risk tolerance? What is my risk appetite? A lot of the time we go into an investment because somebody said, oh, this thing is good. And then we just go in without even checking what the risk uh, is associated with that product is. So we have a simple test that we teach people here at Data Bank and say, imagine you brought your money to Data Bank or you took it anywhere. And in the first year after investing, you went to the bank or you got your statement. You had your medium term, three to five years in mind. You got there after year one to just check. And then they said, oh, boss, the investment, it has gone down by 10%. What would be your reaction? If your reaction is, oh, okay, I'm not concerned. I said I was in for medium to long term, three to five years, only year one. These investments, that's how they are sometimes to go up, sometimes to come down. Then you have a decent risk tolerance. Then you have a decent risk tolerance. If you are like, hmm, this thing, hmm, should I really redraw? Yeah, it's, it's a bit worrying though, these days. Okay, I'll wait a bit and see. I won't redraw, but I'm a bit concerned. Then we put you in the medium category. But if you start panicking and say, hey, I brought 200 CDs. One year, you're telling me now my money is 90 CDs. What is happening? You people, you've chopped my money. We, there, there, are, there, no, we know that you, you are a very low risk person. We won't take you into certain products that can yo you. So then what do we do? We then give you our product list. Now you can see from the left to the right, the different blocks. Now I'm speaking specific to data bank here, specific. So our low risk tolerance products 
are what you see on your extreme left, M fund, Edifan tier one, treasury bills, bonds. Why do we say they are low risk? They are low risk because we invest mostly in fixed income products for these um, ones. It's in bills, bonds, you know, like ESLA and like T-bills, like government of Ghana, you know, treasuries and all that. So the probability of it losing value, like um, nominal value is, is really low. So if you're a low risk person, we tend to push you here. Now, if you're a medium risk person, then you can see what, I hope you are seeing it in yellow. We have added R fund, B fund, Edifan tier two. Why have we added these? These ones have what we call some equities in them. So these products, we invest some of the money on the stock market. Now, you know the stock market and how it works. Tomorrow, the price can go up. Tomorrow, the price can come down. So it can go up or down. And we mix this ag fund, B fund, Edi fund with some of the fixed income funds so that it balances out. So we, we meet each other halfway. So that's where the medium risk people, we tend to direct you towards to purchase. And then when you are high risk and we know that you can stomach the volatilities and the yo-yoing and up and down, we can add EPAC or we can even buy specific shares for you that tomorrow we can buy you say Fan Milk or MTN or Stanchat, but know that the price when you buy it could be two CDs per share. Tomorrow it could go to 2.8 CDs per share. The next day you come, it is one CD per share. But because your risk tolerance is high and you understand the mechanics of the products, you are cool, you're okay, you don't complain, you don't shout. Normally, another thing I also like to say is, even though risk tolerance changes, you, you, don't, you are not likely to have the same risk tolerance for, the enti for your entire life. Due to so many experiences you may have and you know, ideas, anything happens. So you always have to periodically check yourself to see whether your risk tolerance has changed or, is still, or it has even increased. You can take more risk all the time. But normally your risk tolerance goes down with age. So the younger you are, the more to the right you can stay because then you have time to ride out all the volatilities. So as you grow, you move towards the left, you move towards M fund, B fund. So when my classmates now come to me, when they have only eight or nine years to retire and say, oh, Koju, I'm about to retire now, I want to start preparing. I, I feel very sad because they've lost 30 years already. Don't be like them. Don't be like me and my friends. Don't lose 30 years. Start now. But then I direct them towards M fan T bills, Eddie fan tier one. Then what do you do next? After you figured out your risk tolerance and you know you've now understood the products, you've talked to the professionals, you know which company you are dealing with, you know who is regulating them, you start. And at Data Bank, we've made it simple. Star 6100 hash, register, open your account, and you are good to go. We have other sources as well. You can go onto our website, www.databankgroup.com. Um, you can you know, call us on 0302-610-610. And um, we are there. We are there. We are everywhere. Um, we, are, we have our main branches at Krake, Kostema, Koforidia, Kumasi, Takradi, Sunyani, Tamaleho. And watch this space. Why is hopefully, hopefully coming along. We are with GT Bank in their airport, East Legon, La Paz, Medina, Osu, Opera Square, Sherman, Kaswa, Takwa and on UST campus with UBA. Thank you very much, Jillian. I hope I haven't finished your time. Ah, thank you very much, Kojo. Um, you have slightly, but it was worth Sorry. it. So no problem. I um, think I missed whether the, the, the compounding effect was monthly or, or annual, the 44 CDs, the mm -hmm, monthly, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yes, monthly. I think I missed that, I, I didn't say. But we even compound daily anyway. Yes, we so, compound daily. Yeah. Yeah. So I very quickly, we will, we have, um, we had actually wanted to do this within two hours. I will seek the group's permission and um, guys will go for about maybe another 
15 to 20 minutes or so, just to try and get answer a few of the questions. Um, so if you have to go, um, thank you. If you are able to stay, thank you as well. So Kujo, the first two questions that I want to um, touch on are from the chat, then I'll move to the hands. One person is asking on the slide that spoke about having your money uh, separated into different accounts. He's asking whether won't having several investment accounts cancel out your money? That's question number one. Um, do you want to answer that one before I move to the next one? Yes, yes, I'll answer it. I, 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 no, okay. no, not, not at all. It, it doesn't do anything at all. It doesn't cancel out your money. It doesn't do, I, I have a friend here who has about 13 different accounts. <laughs> Jillian knows who I'm talking about. She has about 13 different accounts. And um, when she gets her monthly uh, money, then she splits it according to whatever um, ratio she has. So not at all. It doesn't cancel it out. It actually evens things out because depending on which product you have and depending on what is in there, what is happening in the economy, maybe some part is not doing too well, then another part will do very well and it will balance it out. So it's always good to have split um, accounts and have different um, products within it to even out the risk that you run. So uh, we always encourage multiple accounts. Thank you. Um, the next question um, from Daniel, he wants to know, he wants you to touch on the security of money uh, with regard to the recent collapse of the investment and banking um, facilities in the country. So his question is, in this era, you plan for a long period of time, say 10 years, and the bank or investment facility can't even live to that time. What do you do in such a situation? Because trust of the banking or investment sector is a bone of contention here. How can you help him with that response? I totally agree with his question, but um, Gillian, you know, my answer to this question is usually half an hour. I take my time to really <laughs> explain, but I can't do <laughs> I can't do half an hour to explain that. But very quickly, right. um, first of all, um, to the person who has the question, trust me, the law actually protects your money, and I, I I I'm speaking from experience. The law does protect your money. If the financial institution you are dealing with is following the law appropriately, it is unlikely. I didn't say it's impossible. I mean. I won't say it's impossible, it's unlikely that the person is that the financial institutions go under. But that's why when I was also speaking, I said, try and find out who regulates, who is behind it, who are the people running, whatever it is that you're investing. But that said, please note also through the financial crisis that happened, even though um, pe people didn't get exactly what they expected, um, I think the regulators have managed um, to try and get people's monies ultimately back to them, even though they didn't get it all bulk. So that's why I said, if you've invested in a properly regulated institution, and uh, say if it's regulated by Bank of Ghana or in our case, Securities and Exchange Commission, and it's properly regulated and they are following the rules, and then they will then have the law protecting you. So those under Bank of Ghana say their monies ultimately got back to them through either GCB or CBG or, or something like that. So just know who or where you are investing, follow the rules, read around them, and make your decision yourself, not through rumor. That's the short answer. I can spend 30 minutes on this. OK, thank you. Um, so I'll go to Mami, uh, who has her hand up, and ask her to ask her question. OK, thank you very much. My question is, okay, for me, I live within my means. And as a result, friends around me think, okay, since I'm not asking anybody for money, I'm, I'm okay. They end up asking for money all the time. Once the month ends, they keep on asking for money. You give them, and sometimes when you don't give them, then it's like you are being insensitive to their needs. So what should I do? when they keep on asking. Meanwhile, I don't really have what they are asking for. So sometimes I divide them, but it's not really helping me. Please, what do I do? Thank you. 
Mommy, I share your pain. I mean, your shoes. In fact, <laughs> when the month is ending, sometimes I don't even park my car at the office anymore because I don't want them to know I'm in the office. Um, but on a more serious note, look, um, this is my advice. You, you, you have to stop at a point. You, you have to really stop. You've helped the person. Um, you, you, in my case, even, I, will op I have opened investment accounts for people who come and beg me and say, look, this time I'm giving you this 100 CDs. I'm putting it in an investment account. It's up to you now to manage it properly and allow it to also grow small, small. And I'm not going to give you any money again. Look, if because I will not give you a tip at the end of the month, you will not be my friend again. So be it. Because you are being my friend to drain me. You are not being my friend to help me grow. So, mommy, if you can, walk away. If you can't, still walk away. That will be my advice. All right, thank you. Um, next, I will ask Emmanuel to unmute himself, followed by Isaac. Okay, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I really appreciate. Uh, over the years, I've been hearing of data bank, but uh, I wasn't able to have the opportunity to uh, get a detailed explanation like what I'm having today. But recently, a friend was able to advise me on this, and I was able to open the account through online. And uh, there is, I didn't know what, whether what I did was a mistake. I was able to invest an amount of money into the EPAC account. Then uh, by the day, I realized that it keeps decreasing. Then I found out from my friend and he explained to me just as my boss rightly put it today. So I want to, what I want to verify is that I am a risk taker anyway. I don't have problem with that. But for about 10 years, that amount that I have invested, could it happen that I would lose everything? If so, would you advise me to withdraw and share in some of the uh, the investments like the M fund, the ACT fund, and so on, would it be advisable if I can withdraw and share among all these uh, investment packages? Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. From the picture, I see you look like a very young man um, with your mustache trimmed as Rami has recommended, even your punk has been well trimmed. So anyway, um, to answer your, your question, um, the, the, the research does not suggest that um, over the 10 year period, you will come to zero. Um, so far, the data points we have, have not shown that. But admittedly, I must say the last five years has been quite rough um, for, for EPAC. But I will not recommend that um, you, you take your money out and share it among. What I would rather do is if you are a bit, um, you are sounding like you are moving from high risk to medium a bit, any further monies that you have, you can then put um, some into, into M fund or the less volatile ones. But I will not recommend that you withdraw. Anybody who has um, redrawn midstream trying to play the market has ended up losing. The, um, I know Jillian has some slide that shows um, those who have tried to play the market and they end up losing. So I'll recommend you keep it um, in EPAC. If you are not too comfortable adding more, you can then put any uh, uh, new ones that will come into the less volatile ones like M fund, F fund, B fund. That would be my answer. But thank you for opening the account. And thank you for being our ambassador. Thank you, Kojo. All right. Um, next, Isaac, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, good afternoon. Isaac. Yeah, yeah no, Isaac, you're... My own is not... 
question. Okay, Isaac, please pause. Isaac, you're, I'm muted, I've just muted you. Last year, around... Hang on, let me see if I can mute him. I walked to the head of this in Accra. So I'm trying to actually mute him and I am not being able to do that. How about Daniel? Because we can't hear him. Yeah. Hello. Isaac, we were unable to hear you. Hello. Your connection. Please can you hear me? No, we were not able to hear anything you said. Your connection was very bad. Okay, I think we just lost him. So let me move to Hakima. Uh, Hakima, please oh. go ahead. Thank you very much. Please, can you I can go ahead? ahead? Yes, okay. you can go ahead. Thank you. Please, I wanted to ask, um, Considering the fact that the short-term investments such as the T-bills, where one can do maybe a 91-day rollover of the, the principal amount and then the interest accrued um, and still enjoy the interest rate on that for over three years, would you think that um, that would be a better strategy for somebody instead of going into the EPAC or the shares? Um, do you think that in the long term, for instance, if you do a, a short term investment strategy like the T bills and you allow it to mature and keep rolling over every 91 days for like five years, um, do you think the, um, the end? result of that is more than what somebody who initially started with EPAC or shares will get. Okay, Hakima, thank you very much. I used to think like you um, some years ago. So um, this, this is it, um, let, let, me, let me explain it to you. If you buy treasury bills, 91 day treasury bills, and you do not allow it to run for the 91 days, and you go day 80, you are hot, you need some money, you go day 80, that you want to break the investment and withdraw, you will lose. They will, they will give you your money, but at a heavy discount. And if you have no intention to withdraw after 90 days, and you think you can go one full year, some people don't take the one year paper, but will take a 91 day paper rollover, 91 day rollover, 91, because they are never sure whether within that one year they will need the money on day 90 or day 181. So it all depends on your planning, your objective, and why you are investing. If you come to EPAC, M Fund, EDI Fund, these are mutual funds. And with mutual funds, for M fund as an example, or all of them, you can come and invest on Monday. And on Friday, you can come and pull out your money. Only that we have minimum recommended holding periods. Uh, M fund, Eddie fund, and the like, we, we recommend three months. EPAC, I think we recommend three years to five years because we know how the market dynamics work. But with mutual funds, honestly speaking, you can come for your money any day. So you should ask yourself, if I put it in M fund on first and I need the money on 25th, yes, I can come and just on 25th, take my money, whatever interest has accrued on it, whatever amount I want, I take it. That is the flexibility the mutual funds, M fund, EPAC, ACT fund, B fund, ED fund gives you. T bills are a bit more restrictive because Government needs that certainty that I have borrowed and I will pay you back only after 90 days or 180 days or 364 days. So I hope that answers your question. So there's no right or wrong. 
but you should just know what it is you want and the consequences of breaking a T-bill investment against the consequences of also pulling out your money from a mutual fund. I hope that answers you. All right. Thank you, Kojo. Um, let me just switch over to the chat uh, very briefly. So someone wants to know if Data Bank has a dollar investment account and then someone else wants, so I'll add, there are three questions that I want to, to answer. One is about um, options for dollar accounts. Second is, <laughs> somebody says, says that emergencies are relative. So from um, Kojo, your experience, what expense would push you to enter your emergency account? So the first one was dollar accounts. The second was um, what would cause you to dip into your um, emergency funds? And then the third one is um, the person is asking about diversity. So he's asking about diversification. Um, and whether diversification is about investing in different packages in one firm or spreading it across companies. And then he also wants to hear about the data bank housing account. Okay, I've given you quite a bit. Yeah, okay. So the only dollar investment option that I know I, that we will recommend that is properly, um, what was the word, properly, um, monitored or, or, or regulated is the way that is properly regulated will be euro bonds and so if you want to have a dollar investment at data bank um, right now the only option we'll give you will be euro bonds but because of the costs and the administrative expenses involved i think we do not do anything less than chilean correct me hundred thousand dollars yes we don't do anything less than hundred thousand dollars so otherwise we do not do any dollar investments. Then um, what, what will constitute an emergency for me? Um, everybody has a different, will have a different um, definition for emergency. So let me use medical, which is usually a common thing. So I've, thankfully I have a medical cover from where I work. So if I fall sick suddenly, the expectation will be that the firm will pay the, my bill up to a certain amount. Um, if they cross, if I cross that amount, then maybe it becomes an emergency. But luckily for me right now, both parents are alive and I am aware that someone like my mom doesn't have any medical cover right now. So if she falls ill or something happens, that will be an emergency for me that I'll dip my hand into my emergency account to sort my mother out. But everybody is different. If you have a car and it's not comprehensively insured, and unfortunately you have an accident that is your fault, you will then have to dip into your emergency account to fix your car. But if it's comprehensively insured, then you just go to the insurance firm to do it. Um, diversification is both diversifying your products uh, in one firm. And, I, and I'm quite proud to say it's actually data bank that has the most array of products where you can diversify so widely within one firm. Um, but yes, you can also include other firms um, where you can diversify. So you can put some of the money. We, we are not afraid of that at all, um, but we believe we are the best. So diversification could be both within one firm and across firms. Have I answered all? Yes. Um, and then in the no, interest of DHA, DHA is yours. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> DHA is yours. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, so DHA refers to data bank housing account. It is a new account um, that we rolled out late last year around September. And what it basically is, is an investment account to help people save towards either purchasing a home, um, whether in full or down payment on their home or purchasing land um, that they want to build a home on. The whole point of that account is that most people, 
they're doing everything and they're not preparing for their housing and they're getting to retirement again and they don't have a house to live in and they're living with a child or a friend or they're renting. So the goal is to really help people prepare for their housing. How it works is it's the underlying investment is M fund, but it has another, a, a number of different features that are built in. For example, um, we have partnered with First National Bank. Um, it's a, they're a mortgage provider. They, through this partnership, will give a, like a discount on a mortgage rate if you want to get a mortgage, or they will also give you access to certain loans, um, building related loans as well through this program. So that, that's one thing. The second um, benefit of the housing account is that there are certain incentives we've built in as you go along the journey. So when we talk to you at first, we will ask you how long do you want to get your house or land? Um, and what is the amount that you think you will need? And then when you hit 25% of that goal, you will get a reward. When you hit 50%, you'll get a reward. When you hit 75%, you'll get a reward. And those rewards um, will be anything from small appliances like microwave, toaster, freezer, those things. So there, there's that part of it too, that we, we are really interested in helping you get there. And so we're looking for ways to, to just make sure that you stay focused towards that goal. To get started, um, it's a minimum of 500 CDs, but for most people, 500 CDs will not buy you a house if you do that every month. So that's why it's really important that we will sit with you, figure out what that amount is on a monthly basis that we need to invest towards and then help you get there. But the housing account really is to help you, help those of you who want to get a home, get that home without taking on too much debt um, as Kujo spoke about at the beginning. So if you have any more questions, just reach out to us and um, somebody can explain further. So let me, um, let me just take, I think two last questions. Um, and I'm sorry, there are so many hands up. I will ask everybody, put your questions in the chat and we will still, we'll, we'll respond. We can't respond and keep everybody on the line. So we'll respond after and then make sure. As I had mentioned earlier, the thing, the program is being recorded. We'll share the recordings. Uh, so let me just take the last question from Awusu Agbe. Please um, unmute yourself and Hello. Um, let's hear what you have to say. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity and the presentations. Uh, my question has to do with, uh, there are a lot of portfolios. I would like to know, as a beginner, uh, do we have people available that can take us through, in case I walk to the office, who will have time to take me through the various portfolios? because I'm asking because I've seen the three levels of portfolios. I've seen some that runs through all the levels of portfolio from the low, medium to high risk. So I would like to know, are there somebody on the standby? And then secondly, on the issue of multiple uh, uh, investment, is it multiple investment in the same institution or is multiple investment in different uh, me, because you are talking about risk. So if one doesn't work, should we look at other institutions? I know you have a lot of portfolios, but as we are talking about multiple because of the risk factor, is it multiple for portfolios in the same institution or a different, like spread across the various institutions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Could you? Yeah, okay. So to answer your first question, yes. Um, at the end of my presentation, I showed you uh, locations, but you can visit any of our locations physically um, to talk to any of our relationship managers. They will, yes, have time for you and, and take you through the different um, products and what it is you, you can do. I don't know where you live, but depending on where you live, you can shorten your, your journey and, and get somebody to take you through. 
Um, regarding um, the, the risk issue, I, I think I had answered that it all also depends on you. You can diversify your risk within the same firm and you can diversify your risk also across different firms. And I did say that most firms don't have that many array of products that we have at Data Bank, um, but it, 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 I, I, it, there's no right or wrong. You are encouraged to diversify it the way you are comfortable with. So you can diversify within one firm or you can diversify across firms as well. It's all up to you. All right, thank you very much, Kojo, and thank you, everybody. So um, as promised, we do have a few final um, giveaways. There okay. is, just to explain how that part works again, you have, I think you are able to send your messages to the host. So it doesn't show to everyone. It may come to me or it may go to me as a co-host or it may go to the main host. If it goes to the main host, I do not see it. So please, um, in your responding, just select my name as co-host for this particular um, purpose. Select my name and so that all your answers come to me and I can see it and I can see who has sent their message first. Um, so let me just... Okay, let me do the final questions and then we will wrap it up. And again, um, as I'm asking these questions, I've said, put your questions in the chat. There are some really good questions that you've asked and we would love the opportunity to respond to them. All right, so the first question, and this is for, so there are, again, two 20 CD airtime vouchers. And for those of you who have one airtime, um, you will get it after the program, not right now while the program is going on. So just allow us uh, a little bit of time. We will send you um, the airtime. So this question is for, um, I'll take the first two correct answers and it's for 20 CDs airtime. And the question is, question number one is, Actually, hold on, let me open my chat so I don't miss it. Okay, ready. What are the three investment accounts mentioned in Kojo's presentation? What are the three investment accounts Kojo mentioned in his presentation? The, there were three types of investment accounts he mentioned. Not funds, not funds. What are the three invest? Aha, um, Davida Hooper is the first person. Hang on. All right. So now let me see which ones came in first. Uh, all right. Okay. So Davida correctly answered emergency, retirement, multipurpose. So Davida, please put your details in the chat and let me see who is the second one. Um, then Kingsley, Edu, you also answered correctly, retirement, multipurpose, emergency. So both of you will get 20 CDs airtime. All right. Um, the next question is for a 50 CD gift voucher. And I will take two, the first two correct answers. Okay, 50 CDs gift voucher. Question is, how many months of living expenses should the funds in your emergency account cover? All right, yeah, this one was fast. Okay, 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 I've gotten it. Um, so Kennedy is first, uh, three months is the correct answer. Serum added Adadevo second. Um, so both of you, again, put your information in the chat and we will get back to you. Last question, and I'll take two. Hey, will I? Uh -huh, I will. I'll take two, the first two responses again. And this uh, one will be for a 100 CD investment voucher. The other one 
so no, in fact, two of them will be for 100 CDs investment vouchers. So first two answers that are correct is what I will take. Let me jump to the end. Okay. Um, in the presentation that Kojo just did again, um, he mentioned that when it comes to budget budgeting, there was a slide about where you spend your money. There was a, a rule that he gave, 50, 20, 30. What does the 50, 20, 30 mean? What was the, the description of 50, of 20, and 30? Okay, so I need all three, not just one. So 50, 20, 30. Okay, I see the first one. All right, hang on. And whew, one second. Okay, hang on. So let me just go back to the first correct answer is Joshua Sarpong says investments 20%, wants 30%, and essentials 50%. So Joshua, you just got 100 CDs and investment voucher. Then let me see who is the second. Um, Sarah, again, 50 essential, 30 ones, 20 investments. Thank you. And final, final, final one is um, 100 CDs shopping voucher. And I'm only taking one correct answer for this one. So uh, listen up. And your final question is, Okay, in Kojo's slide, again, he gave the chart that spoke about um, the importance of starting to invest early, and he gave different amounts for the different time periods. Um, okay, Sarah, I, I, I'll, I've seen your chats. Yes. Uh, so he spoke about if you're 20, how much you'd need to invest, 25, 30, 35, on and on. How much did he say a 25 year old would need to invest monthly to get to, I see the answers coming in, 1 million CDs. Wow, you guys are fast. Okay, so now I have to go back to the top of that list. All right, okay, no, still higher. Okay. Um, uh, Okay, William Morrison, uh, 89 CDs, and Beryl Ando. How many prizes was I giving away? One or two? I think, okay, I'll give away two. Anyways, so William and Beryl, put your details in the chat, and um, you have just one 100 CDs shopping voucher each. So, to everyone, uh, we have actually come to the end of the program. Here's what we will do though, just to give you time to put your questions in the chat. We will leave the meeting open for another 10 minutes. There'll be music in the background. You're free to sit in and dance if you would like, but use the time to put any questions in the chat that you would like to. We will get back to you after the program is done. So, and when you put your question in the chat, if you want us to call you instead, um, you can put a phone number. If not, we will reach out to you using the email address that you use to register. So thank you. Um, let me just say to Rami, who is still on, and to Kojo, thank you both so much for everything that you have done. Um, we are very, very grateful for all the insights. And we look forward to having you both back again and again and again. As for Kojo, you'll be back um, by force. But Rami, we look forward to having you back as well. So thank you all very, very much. Uh, we will close the program officially at this point. Um, and the prayer that Emma said at the beginning will hold at the end. Um, so thank you, Rami. Uh, thank you so, so much. You'll hear from thank us. And you. guys, take your time, put your questions in the chat. We will get back to you. And the recording will be sent out in the next day or two. And yes, Joshua, please leave your contact details. It helps. Thank you all. Thank you.